Hello and welcome to new security features in SQL Server 2016. My name is David Postlethwaite. I'm a database administrator for a large financial services company on the south coast of England. I've been working as a DBA for the last 10 years and I currently manage both SQL and Oracle instances. Previous to that, I was a developer using .NET, SQL, Access, FoxPro and Oracle. And way back in time, I was a Windows and a Netware administrator. I'm an occasional contributor to the blog on gethinellis.com and if you wish to contact me, my details are on the screen. I think we've all read about data breaches in the press. Even pretty large companies seem to be able to lose customer information. We're all aware that our data is under attack. Hackers are constantly trying to steal it. Rogue employees are trying to sell it. And we still leave laptops full of customer data in the back of taxis or on the train. Keeping our data safe is becoming an even more important task and with GDPR the fines for losing it are huge and are focusing minds like never before. The good news is that with SQL Server 2016 Microsoft have added three new features which can help us keep our data more secure. These are available in Azure SQL Database as well as SQL Server and even better they're available in all editions of SQL Server from Enterprise all the way down to express. First of all, we have dynamic data masking. This can hide or obfuscate the full view of the data from users by masking it and replacing some or all of the characters with X's or nines. You can designate which columns you want to mask and the data is masked to all applications that view the table, even Management Studio. Next, we'll have a look at Always Encrypted. Here we can encrypt specific columns in our table, which can then only be unencrypted and viewed using a key and a certificate by the client. This means the data is secure at rest within the database and also in transit between the database and the client application. Finally, we'll look at row level security. Here we can control which users can see which rows of data in a table based on their login. The logic is located and enforced from inside the database, so regardless of how the data is viewed, whether from Management Studio or a client application, the same restrictions are applied. You can use this to prevent unauthorized access to shared tables or to implement connection filtering in a multi-tenant environment. So let's kick off with dynamic data masking. The dynamic data masking enables you to obfuscate data by controlling how the data appears in the output of your query so that users who are not authorized cannot see all or some of the columns in your table. It doesn't change the data in the table, it just places a mask over it when it's displayed on the screen. It can be done on an existing table without affecting database operations or requiring changes to application code. Traditionally, to obfuscate your sensitive data, you have had to either code it into your application layer or use views or third party tools. But because these aren't built into the database, it's easy to get around them. Simply use a different application like Excel that doesn't know the rules. But with SQL Server's dynamic data masking, the masking logic is held within the table itself. So it doesn't matter where you run your query, Management Studio or the client application, it'll always be applied to the output of your query, which makes it much more secure method of implementing masking. Dynamic data masking can be very useful when copying a production database to test or production support. You could define your masks in your production database, but only activate them in the UAT database, potentially saving many hours running obfuscation code. Currently, there are only four predefined functions for masking. We've got default, which replaces all the characters with X's and all numbers with zero. More of a way to hide the complete value than mask part of it. We have the email function, and this displays the first letter of the email address, followed by XXXXX, and then puts at XXXX.com at the end, regardless of the actual domain name. Random replaces numbers with random values from a specific range. Partial, which is probably the most useful one. Here you can define the number of characters to display at the beginning and at the end of your string and the masking characters in the middle. In Azure, there's a masking function listed called credit card, but this is actually just a predefined partial function that displays the last four characters of the credit card number. 
The code for dynamic data masking is pretty straightforward. We just add masked with and the function that you wish to use to the column and we can alter an existing table in a similar way. There's no GUI within Management Studio that I can find to do this, so you'll have to do it using T-SQL. If you're applying masking to an Azure database, there is an option in the Azure portal that will even try to recommend fields that it thinks should have a mask on them. You don't need any special permissions to create a table with a dynamic data mask, only the standard create table and alter on the schema. If you want to change an existing table, either add, replace or remove a mask on a column, you require the alter any mask permission along with the alter permission on the table. All users with select or DB data reader permissions will see the masked data when issuing queries, but by default anyone with DB owner permissions will always see the unmasked data, which is another reason to ensure you design your database security correctly. But this can be revoked. You can turn it off if you want to. If you want a user or role to be able to view the unmasked data, then you can use the grant unmask command. There's no fine granularity with dynamic data masking. You can't pick and choose which masks within a table affect which users. All the masks are either on or all the masks are off for a table. So let's have a demo. Here I am in SQL Server Management Studio 2017 and I'm connected to a SQL Server 2017 instance on my local desktop. So the first thing I'm going to do is just drop any of the objects, if they still exist, from the previous run. There we go. So let's create a table, very simple table, customers DDM. We're going to create it with a customer ID, first name, last name, social insurance number, credit card, email, phone number. Let's create that and we'll insert some data into it and then we'll have a quick look to see what it looks like. So there are just a simple set of eight rows, first name, last name, social insurance number as we said. Now let's add some masks to our table. So I'm going to add an email function to the email address and to the phone number I'm just going to add the default function. The last name I'm going to use a partial function. So we'll display the first character of that column, the last two characters and five X's in the middle. And I'll also add another partial function to the credit card number, and that will be XXX, 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 and the last four numbers of the credit card. So let me run those in. And that's gone fine. If we wanted to, we could have created it from scratch using this command, so just create table and then specified the mask for each column. Now I am logged in as a DB owner, a system admin, so when I run a select statement against the customer's DDM table, I'm seeing all the data exactly as we would expect to see it in clear text. Now let me create a user called mask user and I'll grant them read access to my table. Now if I run that select statement again, but this time executing it as the mask user, you'll see that we're now seeing the mask data. So we're now seeing that the last name B and the last two characters, A and the last two characters. The credit card number is appearing as how you often see credit cards appearing on bank statements. The email address again is showing the first letter at xxx.com and the phone number we've actually hidden completely with that default function. And that will work from wherever I try and run this query from, from an application just like from Management Studio. Now one of the drawbacks of dynamic data masking, it hasn't changed the data. So a clever user can work out some of the data just by using a where clause. So if I run this as mask user and this time I'm going to look for anyone whose last name is Bryant. And of course, that returns this record. So we know that this person is Ariana Bryant. We've worked that out. It hasn't changed the data underneath. So any where clause still uses the data. 
So malicious users could start working out things like salary details just by using a greater than and less than. To. Now we can allow a user to see unmasked data by using the grant unmask command. So if I grant unmask to mask user and now execute as the masked user, the masked user now sees the clear text data. So that allows us to define users and roles that can see the mask data or the unmasked data. So let me revoke that unmask. And if I just prove that it's working, let's run it again. And we see the masked data again. Now you might think, well, what happens if I write the data to a temporary table? Can I get hold of the masked data that way? No, you can't. When you write masked data into a temporary table, it actually writes the masked data to that table. So here I'm going to execute as mask user and I'm going to write the data into hash temporary table from customer DDM. So let me run that. And it's created that table. So if I select all the rows from hash temp table, you'll see that I'm seeing masked data. Now if we try that where clause again. So if we look now for um, the user where last name equals Bryant, it doesn't return anything because we are now looking at masked data or changed data, not the original data. So you, you can't extract the underlying data, data by trying to write it into a temporary table. So let's just drop that temporary table and revert back again. If you want to drop a mask, it's very easy. Just say auto table, auto column, and drop mask. So if we run that, so if we drop the email column, or if we drop the mask on the email column, and if we execute again, then now the email address is appearing as clear text. If you want to verify which columns in your database have masked columns, then you can use the masked columns table. And that, if I run, will tell me that in the table customers DDM, these three columns have these three masks. Now, there's a few things that you should know if you're going to use dynamic data masking. First of all, masking doesn't prevent you updating a column. Anyone with update permissions can make updates, even though they may see the masked data. As you've just seen, if you copy data from a masked table, you'll end up with the masked data, not the original data in that target table can't apply a masking rule to always encrypted and file stream columns or computed columns but if the computed column depends on a column with a mask then the computed column will be returned with masked data. Um, column set and sparse columns can't be used and a column with masking data can't be used in a full text index. In some cases you can't add a mask on a column with dependencies such as an index you'll have to remove that dependency first add the mask and then recreate the dependency and as we saw it's very easy to crack a mask by using a good use of the where clause in summary you can use dynamic data masking to mask sensitive data in your application but make sure that all logins are set correctly for every way that the data can be viewed ensure no one other than dbas have permissions to override the mask and remember, data can still be updated. It's easy to use brute force attack to work out mass data, and the data is still unencrypted. If you really want to obfuscate the data, you need to use always encrypted. Now, always encrypted was introduced in SQL Server 2016, and again, it's also available in Azure SQL Database. Here you can encrypt columns in a table with a master key and a certificate so they will appear as encrypted strings to those who don't have the required certificate installed on their PC. Once the certificate is installed, the unencrypted data can then be seen. With Always Encrypted, it's the client application that handles the actual encryption and decryption, not the SQL Server. This means that the data is encrypted at rest on the server and in transit between the server and the client. This is different from the original column level encryption introduced in SQL 2005, which only encrypts the data at rest. 
Now I expect that Always Encrypted will go some way to resolving the concern of people worried about putting their sensitive data on a database in the cloud, such as Microsoft Azure. To be able to encrypt and decrypt the data, the application must use an Always Encrypted enabled driver, currently limited to ADO.NET 4.6, ODBC 13.1 and JDBC 6. And it's the driver that carries out the actual encryption and decryption process. The calling application, including SQL Server Management Studio, must also have an extra parameter in the connection string called column encryption setting equals enabled. If you add this without the correct certificate, then your query will error because it can decrypt the columns. If your table doesn't have any encrypted columns, then there's no issue. If you add it to instances earlier than 2016, you'll get a login error. To edit or view the data, you must use a parameterized query. You cannot update it using a normal update query. Additionally, you can't update from Management Studio. It must be from an ADO application such as PowerShell or a .NET application that's using one of those drivers at the top of the screen. To implement Always Encrypted on a column, you'll need to generate a column encryption key and a column master key. The column encryption key encrypts the column data and the master key encrypts the column encryption key. Now the column encryption key is stored in the SQL Server database, but for the master key the database only stores the metadata that points to the key's location. The actual master key is saved in a trusted external key store such as a Windows certificate store or Azure Key Vault. At no time does the database engine use or store either key in plain text. So how does it work? Well, the application communicates with SQL Server via the always encrypted enabled driver installed on your client. So the client connects to the SQL Server with the column encryption setting equals enabled. The client runs a parameterized query. The driver receives this parameterized query and the driver asks the server to analyze the query. The server tells the driver at SSN needs to be encrypted. The server also sends the encrypted values of the column encryption key and also the path to the column master key. And in this case, looking in the local user certificate store. Using this info in the key path, the driver will look for a certificate with that given thumbprint in the certificate school. If it finds the correct certificate, it can obtain the column master key. The driver can now decrypt the column encryption key and encrypt the parameter at SSN received from the application. And the driver now sends that query with the encrypted column values to the SQL server. The SQL Server processes the query and returns the result set to the application along with any metadata for any encrypted columns. The driver will use the column encryption key in its local cache to decrypt the return result set and return the plain text values to the application. If the credit card column in this case is using a different encryption key, then it will have to go through and find the new master key from the certificate store. The important bit to note is that the data remains encrypted in flight and is only decrypted by the application. Now, Always Encrypted supports two types of encryption, deterministic encryption and randomized encryption. Now, deterministic encryption always generates the same encrypted value for any given plain text value. This has the disadvantage that users could guess the information about encrypted values by examining patterns in the encrypted column. So if you encrypted a true-false column, it wouldn't take much guesswork to see which encrypted value was true and which was false. But deterministic encryption allows grouping, filtering by equality, and joining tables based on the encrypted value. Now, randomized encryption encrypts data with different encrypted values for the same plain text value. This is obviously more secure, but you cannot do searches, grouping, indexing, and joining on this type of column. So choose randomized for data that will just be returned as part of a query, and deterministic for data that you need to search on. How do we implement Always Encrypted? Well, the easiest way is to use the Always Encrypted wizard. Right click on the table, select encrypted columns and follow the wizard. 
This will encrypt the column and create a certificate in your chosen certificate store. It's very easy, but may not give you the flexibility that you are looking for. You can create both the column master key and the column encryption key using SQL Server Management Studio. But if you want to actually script the whole thing out, then you can use PowerShell and T-SQL. So you can use the PowerShell command new self-signed certificate to create your certificates and place them in your certificate store. You can then use T-SQL to create your column master key and your column encryption key and then either create or update your table to add the necessary encryption to the columns that you wish to encrypt. So let's have a demo. Here am I back in Management Studio, connected to my SQL 2017 instance. So let me connect to the database I want to use. Drop anything, drop any objects if I've already created them from previous runs. Right, so let's create a table, this time called Customers AE. Similar columns to what we have with Dynamic Data Masking. Similar set of rows of data. And let us have a a view of our data exactly as we saw before same people now what we're going to do we are going to use the wizard to encrypt our data so let me open up the database find my security DB database find the table customers always encrypted right click and go to encrypt columns and that will start the wizard up skip the introduction we can now select the columns that we wish to encrypt and i'm just going to encrypt the social insurance number and the credit card i'm going to use deterministic in this particular case and it's going to create an encryption key called cek underscore auto one i can't change that from the the wizard so let me click next. I'm going to auto let it auto generate column master key. You don't get any choice. I'm going to put it into the Windows certificate store, but you can write it to the Azure key vault if you have one set up. And the master key source will be current user. You can't choose the local machine certificate store from the wizard. So let's click next. Now we have a choice here. We can either generate a PowerShell script so we can run this later because you may not want to shut down your database while it's copying it or we can proceed to finish. So I'm going to proceed to finish. Click finish and this is only eight rows. It's going to generate those keys. It's going to generate the certificate, put it in my certificate store and then encrypt those eight rows. And this still takes quite a little time. So if you had a table with 100,000 rows, you're going to have to find a suitable downtime window to run this. Now that took about a minute to run just for those eight rows and the wizard is now complete. Now if we look down to security on our database, if we open that up, you'll see we have an option here called always encrypted keys. And in there we can see the column master key called CMK Auto 1 and the column encryption key called CAK Auto 1. Now if I look in my local certificate store under personal certificates you'll see we have an always encrypted certificate valid for just a year and that is ready to roll so if we come back to our management studio window and i run a select statement on my table we'll now see that we get encrypted values back we just get a long encrypted string for the social insurance number and the credit card address. All other columns are untouched. Now if we try to insert data into our encrypted database or into those in two encrypted columns, we'll get an error message because it doesn't know how to handle our varchar strings into our encrypt binary encrypted columns. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pick up that parameter reconnect and this time add it in to the options there we go click connect join back up to the security database now when I run a select statement 
I can now see the unencrypted data. Now if I try running a query with a WHERE clause, just a standard WHERE clause from Management Studio, you find it doesn't work because the WHERE clause is obviously in clear text, the column is encrypted and Management Studio doesn't know how to manage that. Now if I run this as a parameterized query, so this time I'm going to declare a parameter. As I said earlier on, parameterized queries are required for always encrypted, but they don't work from SQL Server Management Studio. However, Microsoft have added a, an extra option into Management Studio 2017. If I right click on my query window, go to Query Options, Advanced, we have this option down here called Enable Parameterization for Always Encrypted. This is only available in Management Studio 2017. It's not in Management Studio 2016. So if I click on that, click OK, and now run my query, and you'll see that it's underlined in blue. So when I hold a cursor over it, it says, at SYN will be converted to a system data parameter object of the right size, precision, and scale for Always Encrypted to cope with. And now when I run this, the result is returned. This is specific to Management Studio, but we still can't insert any data, even with this option turned on. It still crashes. If I try and do it as a parameterized query, The insert still fails, saying it can't understand the, the, the encryption scheme that is going on. And if I try to do it as a store procedure, so let me create a store procedure called add customer. And then I try and run that store procedure. With all the parameters. It still fails. So there are problems with Management Studio if you want to do any inserts and updates. It doesn't work. Management Studio doesn't interact with the driver correctly. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up PowerShell and we'll run a PowerShell query. So here I am in PowerShell. This could be your .NET application written with the, the always encrypted .NET driver. But I'm using PowerShell because it's a bit easier to follow than trying to explain compiled C Sharp. So here we're going to connect to our SQL 2017 box to our database called SecurityDB and I've got this option here called column encryption setting equals enabled and first of all I'm just going to do a standard select star from the table. So if I run that you'll see that I get back all the rows of data in my table unencrypted because the encrypted driver is working and I have the column encryption setting enabled option turned on. Now what I'm going to do now is run a query to use that store procedure I just created. So again I'm connecting to my SQL 2017 instance, I'm using the column encryption setting enabled and here I'm going to run my store procedure called add customer and now I'm going to list the parameters that I want to put in. So I'm going to put customer ID, first name and last name, and then I'm going to put in the parameters for my social insurance number. Now with this particular parameter I'm having to declare that the type is a varchar of size 11, the direction is input, and then I'm giving it a value, then I'm adding that parameter in. If I don't do that for the social insurance number, then this query will fail. Now what's a bit strange is that the credit card number doesn't need to have all the specifications of being a VAR chart and the size and the like. I can just specify the parameter as a standard parameter, just saying at credit card and then the number. And I don't quite understand why one works and one doesn't. So let me pull that down a minute so you can see the whole query. And then once we've declared all the values, we just run execute non-query. And it would tell me how many rows it's inserted, which I hope will just be one. So let's highlight all that. 
and run this query. And there we go, one row inserted. If I come back to Management Studio, if I have a look at my table, you'll see that I have now inserted a row called David Postlethwaite with that social insurance number and that credit card. So if you want to do inserts, updates in your always encrypted database, you're going to have to use an application that uses .NET or JDBC or ODBC as always encrypted aware to be able to do that update. You cannot use Management Studio to do it. As you can see from this screen, there are plenty of limitations to always encrypted. This is a list of all the column types that aren't supported. Almost too many to fit on one slide too many to read out. If you're going to use Always Encrypted then obviously please go and check the documentation to make sure it will work for the data types and the column types that you are using. A few more things to be aware of. Change data capture, replication, temporal tables, triggers may fail, distributed queries you may have problems with, um, check constraints and if you're using SSIS you're going to have to do special things to make sure that your always encrypted data is read and processed correctly. Other things to consider, as I've said, currently the only drivers that work with always encrypted are ADO.NET, ODBC and JDBC. If your application uses anything else you're out of luck. You can only search using the equals clause. Anything else doesn't work since SQL uses the encrypted value not the original unencrypted value so therefore greater than and less than and likes are just not going to make sense. And as we see, most importantly, you must use parameterized queries, otherwise you get an error. Now the extra round trip to the SQL Server and the encryption decryption process is going to make your application slower. Inserts and updates could possibly be one and a half times slower. Selects, not so bad. And also the encrypted string will be a lot larger than the plain text string, so you're going to require more disk space. But you can't have something for nothing. If you want secure data, you have to take some sort of hit. Troubleshooting any data issues is going to be much more complicated because you're now dealing with gobbledygook, in most cases meaningless values. You can have to install the certificate on all clients or get them linked to an Azure certificate store if you decide to use that. That's going to be a lot of extra work for someone. For best security, you should be rotating your certificates regularly which also requires a lot of work. So there'll be quite a bit of overhead to set up and manage encryption. And as we saw how long it took just to encrypt eight values, you're going to have to arrange downtime when you initially encrypt your existing table. The encryption process creates a temporary table and copies all the encryption data there, encrypts it all, then deletes the original table and renames the temporary table to the original table. So if there's another application running that's inserting or modifying data in the original table, then you're quite likely to lose it. So always encrypted goes a long way to solving issues of hackers getting to your data. Your data is protected once it leaves the client and your encrypted data is protected even from system administrators on the server. It only requires a change to the connection string. In reality, it may require work to the application to parameterize all your queries. Certificate management is crucial to protecting your data, rotating them regularly in case a hacker does get a hold of them. But it doesn't stop users from viewing data which they shouldn't be able to see. And what you need for that is row level security. Now, suppose we want to limit access to some business data based on the role of a user. For instance, in your company you may want a user to only see data for their specific department and not see data on any other department. Or you may have an e-commerce website with a centralized database used by all your clients. You need to ensure that each client can only see the rows that belong to them and not to be able to see rows of the other client's data. You may need to limit a user's access to only certain rows of the data in the database for all sorts of reasons like compliance standards, regulatory needs or security reasons. Up to now we've had two ways to achieve this. The most obvious is to build the logic into the application that accesses the tables, but this has its drawbacks. As your application grows, you have to constantly test all the different ways to view the data, still use that code logic, and the logic is separate from the database. So what if someone views the table using Excel or Power BI or Management Studio? They'll circumvent 
that access logic and see every row of data. Alternatively, you could use custom views, store procedures and lookup tables to control who can see which rows. This will ensure control regardless of how someone accesses the data, but this can be difficult to maintain and manage and can often cause errors. To make life easier, in SQL 2016 and Azure SQL Database, Microsoft introduced this new feature called Row Level Security. Row Level Security allows you to easily control with complete transparency which data is visible to a user or a role. With Row Level Security, the SQL Database engine restricts access to certain rows based on the SQL Server login or the role membership. We can control both read and write access, and this is implemented at the database layer. It doesn't require application changes or for us to write complex code in the database. Since it's centralized, it works however the data is viewed, and it's easy to implement and maintain, so Microsoft say. Row level security is a form of predicate based access control. It works by automatically applying a security predicate to all queries on a table and the predicate determines which users can access which rows. To implement row level security we need three things. We need a predicate function, security predicates and a security policy. The predicate function is a table valued function that checks whether a user executing a query has access to a row of data based on the logic in that function and this function will return a one for each row that a user is allowed to access. The security predicate helps to join the predicate function to the table and the security policy object groups all the security predicates that reference the predicate function. You'll get it when you see the code. You can have two types of predicates. We have a filter predicate that will exclude rows that don't satisfy the function and we have a block predicate which stops us inserting, update and deleting rows which would violate the filter predicate. So for example in a multi-tenant application it would stop one tenant from inserting or updating another tenant's data. Let's have a demo, that's probably the easiest way to demonstrate this. So here I am in Management Studio connected to my SQL Server 2017 instance and in this example we're going to create a table which is full of customers who come from different territories identified by a territory ID and then we're going to have a group of employees who are only allowed to view customers that belong to their particular territory. So let's first of all drop anything that I have created before in my test runs. Excellent. So let me create my table called customer RLS and this time we're just going to have a customer ID, first name, last name, email address, phone number and the territory ID that they belong to. Now I'm going to insert some data out of the AdventureWorks 2016 CTP database for this purpose. So let me run that and that will insert for us 19,000 customers. Now I'm going to create a table called employees and I'm just going to create a few employees in there in that table. That's it. So I've got an employer called Janice, whose job title is employee, and she manages ID territory ID two. We have another employee called Michael that manages territory ID three three and so on. And at the end we have an employee called David, and he is from a manager level and he has zero as his territory ID. Right, I've already created the user called Janice and Michael. I've created a role called employee and I've added Janice and Michael to the to the role called employee. I've created a user called David and a role called managers and I've added David to those managers. And then I have given those roles read and write access. I've created a schema called security and now I'm going to create a table valued function in that security schema. So here's the function. All we're going to do is we're going to select one from the employees table where the login in that employees table is equal to my login, my username, and my territory ID matches the territory ID that's being passed in. Or 
I'm a member of the manager's role or I'm a member of the DB owner role. And that is my table valued function. So let me run that in. We're then going to create our security policy. So I'm going to create my security policy called customer policy. I'm going to add a filter predicate and a block predicate of my customer row level security table or on my customer RLS table. So let me run that in. And now, because I am database owner, I can see all 19,000 19, rows in my table because I am running this bit of code. So every row will be valid. Now Janice, as we know, is an employee. She's not a member of the manager's role and she's been assigned territory IT ID 2. So if I execute as Janice, she will only get the customers who are part of territory ID 2. Simple. There they are, 57 of them. Janice can delete customers, but she doesn't need to specify territory ID 2 because the cust because our function and our predicates will only allow her to do that to the rows that she's allowed to see. So that will delete one row. Just to prove it, let me run again. There we are, we only have 56 rows in there now. But if Janice tries to delete a row from a different territory ID, so territory ID 10, we just get no rows back. It doesn't find any rows to delete. We don't get any error. She can't update a row in a different territory. Again, the function means there's no, no rows being returned, so there's nothing to delete. There's no error message. If she tries to insert into a different territory to her own, then we do get an error because the block predicate has come in and gone, whoa, no thank you, you can't write to that one, you don't have the ability. But we can insert a customer into her territory. Not a problem. So there's one row inserted. And just to prove it, if I run my select statement, you'll see that we got good customer back again. And she can't steal any customers from a different territory. Again, it doesn't find any rows, so therefore you just get zero rows affected. So let's come out of being Janice. Now, David is a member of the manager's role. So if you remember the function that we defined up here, it's just going to go, if a member of manager, always return one for every single row. So if I execute as David, and I select from customer RLS, I get all 19,000 rows back. And because I am a manager, I can insert into any territory ID I like. That works fine. And just to prove it, here we go. There is that row that I've just inserted in territory ID 88. And of course, being the manager, I can delete all my customers if I want. That's all 19,000 customers deleted. Now, Microsoft recommends that you create a separate schema for your predicate function and security policy, which is what I did in the demo. And to ensure no one can override the policy, they also recommend that you limit the alter any security policy permission to just, say, the security team and then deny them the select permission. And this means they could alter the predicate of the policy, but not actually see any of the data behind it. It's very important that the predicate function is well written and tested to avoid errors that could cause the wrong data to be viewed and isn't so complicated such that it slows down your queries too much. So Microsoft recommends to avoid 
type conversions to avoid potential runtime errors, avoid recursion wherever possible to avoid performance problems, avoid excessive table joins for the same reason, avoid using functions and code that depends on session specific set statements, so avoid converting character strings to dates and vice versa because these can be affected by the date format. Anyone in Europe who's had to deal with dates in the American format will know what a pain it can be. And make sure your code doesn't rely on returning a null, otherwise any error or divide by zero might allow people to see the restricted data. There are a number of things that aren't supported as listed on the screen, so index views, file stream, polybase, memory optimized tables, um, column stores, partitioned views. And be careful if you use any of the features at the bottom of the screen, such as show statistics, change data capture, change tracking or temporal tables, because they may allow people to see all rows in the table, not just the ones they should do. So you'll need to make sure that you've applied rules to ensure that people either can't see those particular things or that they only see the information that they should be allowed to see. So in summary, we've looked at the three security features introduced in SQL Server 2016. Each offers a different way of securing your data. They're pretty straightforward to use and can be added to an existing application without too much reworking. And if you're planning to move to SQL 2016 or 2017 or Azure SQL Database, then these features are definitely worth considering. So I hope you found this useful and that you can now look at ways of making your data safer. You can view more of my videos on SQL Database and Azure on my YouTube channel. And please leave a comment if you enjoyed this, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much for listening.